Good evening, and welcome to the Out of Print Focus panel. Out of Print, as many of you know, is an online journal for the short story connected to the Indian subcontinent. And so moving from the virtual to the real world with a series that's been curated and developed by us at Out of Print, that's a very big step for us. It's only the second time in the history of Out of Print, the 10-year history of Out of Print, and I should make a small plug for our 10-year anthology, The 10 years of Out of Print that we've actually done this go live with our own program, I mean. The first was after the publication of the special issue on sexual and gender violence in 2015 that was initiated by Samhita Arni and guest edited with Out of Print by Samhita and Meena Kandasamy. The live session at the time was held on the terrace of the new G5A building, at the time new, and uh, it was the very festive first event on their premises in collaboration, of course, with G5A and the Asia Society. So basically, it seems that I need the vibrancy and energy of young women to motivate me into action because this out-of-print focus series has been conceived of and brought into existence by Zoe Kumar Reddy, and I thank her for her initiative and effort in making it all happen, especially given that much of the time when it was being formulated, we've been in the slushy slowdown of COVID constraints. The idea behind the Out of Print Focus series is to use the stories published in the magazine to examine a singular idea or concept and explore it with the authors, explore how it impacts their writing, how their writing impacts society, how it can possibly move society, maybe even bring about change. For each session, we invite the Out of Print authors whose stories we're looking into and a guest author. This time the series is held in collaboration with the Bangalore International Centre. The first time that they're holding hybrid event in their auditorium. We're really tremendously grateful to BIC and the BIC team here, Lekha, Raghu, Ravi, for making it all possible and for agreeing to collaborate with us. Thank you once again to the authors, to the guest author. Welcome to the Out of Print Focus series, the first in the series on writing sex during, before, and after the time of Corona. And I'd like to thank the uh, Bangalore International Center for collaborating with us. A big thank you to everyone uh, in the staff for opening up the auditorium. It was the first ever hybrid event at BIC, I think, since uh, uh, Corona. So, I mean, that's a big deal. Um, Lekha, we thank you for all the coordination and logistics, Rami, for allowing us to have this here. Um, okay, let's get focused. Thank you, Indy, for that beautiful introduction. Um, I want to start by paraphrasing Murakami, just in case anyone was wondering, fully literature panel. But um, about short stories, he said, my short stories are like the guideposts to my heart. And I thought that was interesting because there's something in a short story that really captures a moment in time and an emotion or a feeling, a flavor, a smell, and essentially the voice of the person behind it. And for the past 10 years, Out of Print has really built a platform to showcase these voices and uh, these moments in time. And these moments in time. So as a result, we have an archive of these voices from across the Indian subcontinent that we can really draw from. We can look at these ideas and we can look at these emotions. And the idea behind this panel was to get writer and reader together and draw from these emotions and develop a discourse to move into the future with. Um, move into the future with keeping in mind the emotions felt around the Indian subcontinent over the past 10 years, the ideas that have come together. And just keeping our minds open and having fun and um, not being too rigid in the way we think and express ourselves. The reason Indy and me wanted to have our first panel um, on the theme of writing sex during the time of Corona is because I think one of the most marked changes we felt as a human race this past year has been the physical distance between each other. And we were interested in the way that this would um, affect the way we both felt desire and then expressed desire. So that's the reason we wanted to start off these panels 
of this subject. Additionally, before we begin, I just want to let the audience know and also uh, remind the writers once more. Uh, we had asked the writers to look at, and perhaps the audience can do this too while we have this discussion, but to look at the reasons they write for their own personal journey, and then to also examine what they would like their writing to do for the world at large. So that's just a, something that we'd like for everybody to have at the back of their minds as we go forward. Um, with that being said, we will begin with the out-of-print authors and with Nikhat Gandhi first, whose story, The Cow, um, is a translation of uh, Fintos Heather's originally written in Urdu short story, but also titled The Cow. Maybe India would like to say a, word, a few words first. I mean, I think we can go straight into it. Um, Negat brought the story to us, um, you know, at the time it was published. And uh, uh, Negat, maybe you could just give a little summary of the story as we go into uh, into the discussion, and then we can go. Okay, so I have about 10 minutes, and I'll try to pack in as much as I can in these 10 minutes that I've been uh, granted. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to talk about, and let's jump right into it, I want to talk about the sexual desire of the elderly population, okay, so uh, especially the older woman, okay, uh, when we think of sexual desire of uh, older people, especially women, we think that it's, it's basically invisibilized, repressed, denied, and how do we think of the older woman, I mean, she's uh, a grandmotherly, matronly kind of figure. Either she is a doting grandma or she is a whiner or a nagging person. Okay, certainly uh, we don't think of them as sexual beings. Uh, if I uh, think of some prevailing stereotypes that we have about older people, and this of course applies to elderly women, uh, what are they? They are like um, uh, these people are older people are conservative. They are. Um, most of them are progressing towards senility. They're pessimistic. They, are, um, they have many negative personality traits like they nag, whine, complain. They are unattractive and definitely asexual, right? Uh, asexuality can be a choice, but here I think it's culturally and socially an imposition uh, for the older person. Um, so I was working on a play recently, uh, and it's still in progress, and I called it Rumi and I, and it's about an older woman in her late 60s who uh, is living alone and has acquired a personal robot for her to do the things that she can't do on her own anymore because of her growing uh, disabilities. And soon she starts to develop an emotional bond with this uh, robot. And also there are sexual feelings. The robot, of course, can't reciprocate these uh, feelings. So I'm just giving you a, a, a gist, gist of the, the uh, themes that I'm trying to explore in the play. Um, so when we look at um, aging is a dimension of my marginalization, right? Now, to add to the aging another dimension of marginalization, which may be sexual orientation. So the older gay man or the older lesbian uh, ha is even more invisible in our uh, society as a sexual being. I remember talking to Salim Kedwai, you know, the, the co-author of the uh, classic you know, uh, same-sex love in India a couple of years ago. And he mentioned that on dating sites like Grindr, it's um, almost impossible to find older gay men. Uh, and being old is a subjective category. We are as old as we think we are. But let's say for the sake of this discussion, we're talking about people 60 and 60 plus and older. Okay? So he said that um, that demographic is just simply missing from those sites, either because those uh, older men, older gay men can't access those uh, technologies or they just are not out or they just feel afraid or uh, insecure about because these platforms are very often dominated predominantly have younger um, users so um the point is that uh, we are an aging population and in in just 30 years by 2050 we're going to have like 20 percent of india's population and i think this is also true of the rest of the subcontinent is going to be uh, constituted by adults 60 plus and over 
Uh, and uh, since women have a higher life expectancy than men, uh, there will be a lot more older women in our population. And um, I think that we really need to pay some attention to the older adults uh, as, as people who may have erotic sexual desires and not just write them off uh, the, uh, you know, the radar of sexuality. Um, uh, I was told to talk a little bit about the story that I had translated uh, from Ferdos uh, Heather's Urdu original. Um, she was writing at a time in the early 80s when um, uh, she, she was a Pakistani writer. So she was uh, writing at a time when Ziaul Haq, the military dictator, uh, who brought in the Islamization program uh, in uh, Pakistan had completely banned all cultural and literary um, activities. So here she is writing about a woman who's trapped in a very um, unfulfilling sexual relationship. And um, she does it by means of an allegorical story where the symbol of the cow is brought in, how the cow that was tethered in the angan you know, in the courtyard of uh, its owner one day just breaks free of her tethers and goes out and finds the sexual and fulfillment of her desire that she was uh, searching for. Uh, but the story of the woman is intertwined with this. So I thought what I'd do is maybe take two minutes and read to you a short passage from the original Urdu so that you get a sense of the beauty and the flow of the language. For those of you who understand Hindi, Urdu, Hindustani, you will get a sense of the cadence of uh, the music of uh, the way Firdaus uh, wrote this story. And I, this is a great tribute to Firdaus because she passed away a few years ago. And I think November was a month in which it was her birthday. So um, let me read a short passage and then I'll read out the corresponding passage in English. <clears throat> वो खूंटे से बंधी रही उसका बदन सुलगता रहा और उसे बेजमीरी की जिंदगी बसर करने पर मजबूर किया जाता रहा लेकिन उसके वजूद का ज्वाला मुखी पिघलता रहा और उसकी बातनी आंख गहरी होती गई तब उसकी जात के कर्ब ने एक ऐसी सदा सुनी जो तमाम सदाओं पर मुहित थी जो कतरे को समंदर की तरफ और जुज को कुल की तरफ ले जा रही थी Jaise, and here she quotes a couplet from Rumi's Masnavi, and please pardon my really horrible Farsi pronunciation, but I'll try. Bishnu, Bishnu az ne chu hikayat nikunad, was judai ha shikayat nikunad. And then back to the story. Jaise ki baazgash sunai di ho, aur uski zaat mein halchal bharti gai, wo baasuri ki tarah apne lay ke dard mein surur hasil karne lagi. Tab usse yakin ho gaya, कि जब दर्द इंतहा को पहुंचेगा तो वो घड़ी आके रहेगी जिसका उसे इंतजार है और यही यकीन उसकी जात में उम्मीद की शमे रोशन करता रहा और उसी उम्मीद ने इंतजार के पहाड़ को उसके सामने झुकने पर मजबूर कर दिया दुनिया वालों ने उस दर्द को उस इंतजार को उस एतमाद को महज ऐसाबी तनाव समझा मगर वो अपने अंदर एक नाकबिल तस्खीर कुत बन गई वो पत्थर वजूद उसका खुदा उससे खायब होकर उस पर अपनी गिरफ्त मजबूत करता रहा और माहिर साइंसदानों की मदद से उसके हलक में तलख और नशा आवर सयाल उंडेलता रहा वो किसी सूरत भी गाय से दसबरदार होने के लिए तैयार न था कि गाय उसका सिंबल थी और उसके चौड़े चुकले वजूद की तस्दीक थी प्यार से परबत कट सकता है और लोहा लोहे को काट सकता है मगर कोई तेशा तखलीक की उमंग को नहीं काट सकता न कोई उस सुरूर पर हावी हो सकता है जो तखलीक की तमन्ना ने बख्शा हो आई कुड गो ऑन रीडिंग बट आई स्टॉप बिकॉज आई टू रन आउट ऑफ माई अलॉटेड टाइम वेरी सोन सो लेट मी रीड दॉन्डिंग इंग्लिश पैसेज इन इंग्लिश फॉर दोज ऑफ यू हुड नॉट She remains tethered to the post. Her body burns slowly. This is my translation of uh, the cow. She was compelled to lead this conscienceless life. Her inner eye opened deeper as the lava of her essence kept melting away. 
Only then did her soul hear a voice that drowned all other voices, a voice that propelled her as the drop is propelled towards the ocean. And here's that Rumi Masnavi couplet. Listen to the tale the flute has to tell. She speaks of the pain of separation. The restlessness of her soul grew more intense. Like the flute separated from its reed bed, she found solace in the cries of her own music. Only when the pain crossed its limits, limits, the moment she was waiting for would arrive. This faith kept lamps of hope lit within her. It was this belief that finally made her victorious, that assuaged her longing. The world simply belittled her desires and her convictions as nothing more than mental distress. But within herself, she felt she was becoming an indefatigable strength. Her worldly lord, angered by her growing strength, tightened his grip on her. He began forcing strong and bitter drugs upon her. Under no condition was he prepared to give up the cow. She was the symbol of his power, the proof of his towering grandeur. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, I wanted to say at the end that nowhere in the passage does Ferdos mention the word sex or sexual desire. And yet, if you read this story, it's a very erotic story. And um, she, she achieves this with just the beauty of her language and the allegory. So I think my time is up and um, I'll uh, pass the mic on to others. Thank you. And maybe uh, later on when we are having, when we open up to chat a little, you can tell us a little bit about Fiddles also and how she- Definitely. Uh, how you came across her and how she came to write this story perhaps. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and before we uh, finish Lisa, I just said that you brought up two really interesting points. Um, one, which we had spoken about earlier on the Zoom, was the necessity for an intergenerational conversation on sexuality. Mm -hmm. And the second was, um, yeah, just with the richness of her words, this was a story so much about your thing, so much about desire, um, yet her writing wasn't necessarily lack of a better word, explicit. So that's something in the discussion that also I, I hope we can talk about. Yeah. And now to Sweta, who's coming, um, speaking to us from Malaysia, um, who will be talking about her story. I thought Sweta's story was really important to include in our discussion today because it speaks about a repression. And I feel for a lot of us, repression is as much as a part of our sexual identity as expression. So um, with that being said, I think we can move to Sweta. Um, hi. Uh, OK, so I, I guess I will We'll start with a short summary of the story. Uh, the story is uh, my old hometown is the story of a girl called Gauri who goes home for, for a wedding and plans to introduce her girlfriend to her family. Uh, through her other cousins, Gauri realizes that her father had found out about her girlfriend. So Gauri is forced to choose between uh, standing up for her relationship and, uh, you know, like staying with her family. So in the end, she chooses to stay with her family and she loses her girlfriend and her girlfriend leaves. So this story, uh, My Old Hometown, was first written two years ago. It was written around the time when gay sex, uh, which was previously illegal because of Section 377, was decriminalized in India. Uh, I remember that time. I was still in India and I was scrolling through my Twitter, looking at how everything unfolded. It was something very important to me as a queer woman. So I eventually wanted to write about it. Uh, this was the temporal context of the story. I think you can also see this in the beginning of the story where Gauri discusses this with her girlfriend. When it comes to the spatial setting of the story, a small town from Southern Tamil Nadu emerged in my mind. The setting of an Indian town really impacted the story. Because for me, uh, I have to intuitively understand the internal rules of the story that I am writing. And these rules largely depend on the setting of the story. So having the story set in a small town meant that sexuality was not something openly discussed. 
And it also meant that my characters wouldn't have a lot of control over their sexuality. Uh, well, I knew this because I grew up in a small town and that's how it was for me. Uh, this was also a context where even heterosexual desires had to conform to a certain norms. The heterosexual desire has to be between two people of the same caste, same religion, be monogamous and uh, should exist only in the context of marriage. For instance, there is a discussion of an intercaste marriage in the story, but even that is not permitted and is disapproved of. As a result of this, I don't really think my characters discuss sex directly in the story. Uh, I mean, the story is from the point of view of the main character, Gauri, so we can see hints of her desire. But her lesbian sexuality is only expressed through her internal thoughts. She doesn't express this out loud. Uh, in the end, uh, she still decides not to say anything about it. She uh, chooses to keep quiet about it. Besides, uh, Gauri's relationship ends because of something that is way out of her control. Uh, her father finds out about her queer identity through her cousin and separates her from her girlfriend without even mentioning why he is doing so. So here, lesbian sexuality cannot be mentioned even when it is not uh, approved of, like even when it is being scolded or when it is you know, discouraged. So there is not a single scene in the story that shows her father or cousins finding out about her queer identity. It is only like assumed what happened from uh, what she he hears about from her cousins. So uh, I think this shows the powerlessness that she feels, uh, like how something completely outside of her control, like just completely destroyed her desire and her feelings of like uh, her sexuality. So as you can see, this is a very bleak story. I wasn't actually very happy with the way it ended. Uh, I, as a writer, I knew that this was the right ending, but as a queer woman, I couldn't help but wonder if there were any alternatives and if that could be a continuation to this story. Perhaps my main character would eventually confess to her parents, would be accepted despite hesitations, and would rush to the bus stop to prevent her girlfriend from leaving like in the movies. Uh, but uh, because I didn't want to live in a world where this was the only possible ending, uh, but unfortunately, the story's world had rules that had to be followed. And that meant that the girls did not have a proper future together. There was simply no space for their sexuality and for their desires. Uh, what was worse for me was that this world was simply a reflection of the world as I saw it. Eventually, in my other stories and poems, I did move a little further into exploring sexuality because I wanted to read stories of normal queer characters living in a world that recognizes sexuality as a more complex, fluid aspect of a person's identity and doesn't reduce homosexuality to a debate on whether it is criminal behavior or not. I couldn't accept the fact that queer sexuality, something that is so integral and important to my identity, just doesn't have a place in a small town that is so similar to where I come from. This lack of space for sapphic sexuality was so embedded to the setting that breaking it would make the story unrealistic. I still wanted to write more lesbian characters and their relationships since it felt very real to me, but this meant that my stories would no longer follow the rules. Even after reading my old hometown, many people were astounded at this new thing I had brought into a traditional household. Of course, lesbian desire and sexuality are definitely not anything new and are likely as old as human civilization. If anything is new, it is the idea of the binary of straight and gay and compulsory heterosexuality, where everyone is presumed to be heterosexual. However, this desire was so out of place in the town that it felt like that it was something new and foreign being brought in by young people. This contradiction between lack of space for queer sexuality in an Indian setting and my desire to write more about lesbian sexuality kind of uh, led, led me to feel disconnected from the setting. And recently, uh, COVID added to the discussion, disconnection since I've been essentially forced to stay in my dorm in a different country all year. As a result, I've started exploring and employing magical realism in my stories in order to discuss sexuality. So the setting of my story has moved away from a concrete contemporary setting allowing me the freedom to construct and deconstruct the rules of the worlds I choose to write. I've started 
uh, writing myths where queer women have agency and can express their sexuality. I've also been writing a novel where uh, queer women combat the homophobia they face and create spaces for themselves. I think that writing about queer sexuality and female desire ultimately helps recognize the humanity in these feelings and reimagining a world where everyone is included. Uh, but in the end, while I love the queer stories and the worlds where queer sexuality has place and power, I still think my old hometown is incredibly important. This is especially because it places lesbian sexuality and desire in India, even though it is not actively discussed and accepted. Uh, through its many silences, I really hope that the story will contribute to the conversation about female desire and queer sexuality in our society. So yes, uh, I, guess, I guess I'll pass the mic on. Thank you, Sita. That was really, um, uh, you really examined where the story came from. And it's a funny thing, I have to tell you, I, when, I, when we uh, received the story in Out of Print, soon thereafter I had a dream where uh, your story, uh, I was reading your story and it had a different ending. And uh, it's so strange, you know, it was so vivid to me that in my sleep, I reconstructed the story, not to have a happy movie ending uh, of the kind who said where she runs to the, to the bus stop, but rather where her partner says, never mind, I understand, uh, which also is a sort of strange and neither here nor there ending. And so I'm glad that you, uh, I'm glad that you uh, kept an ending which had sort of integrity um, um, to, your, uh, to your tale. Um, uh, let's see, yes. Yeah, no, I thought that was so uh, that was so beautiful, Sweta. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move to Vidya and uh, about Vidya's story. I just want to say what I found so interesting was um, the the fact that it was myth and sexuality, and um, those two themes are playing with each other. And um, yeah, would you summarize it quickly for the audience here? Hello everyone, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, my story is called The Year of the Kurunji, and it's about a young woman who loves her husband very much, but when faced with his impotence, she starts, she finds herself dreaming of his four brothers, um, of finding sexual fulfillment with his four brother, with her, uh, with, with her husband's four brothers or four brother-in-laws. Um, so five brothers, one woman, that's clearly, um, that's clearly a sort of a story of Draupadi, uh, who is the central character, uh, central female character in uh, the great Indian epic Mahabharata, which I'm sure we all uh, we all know. Um, why why did I when I started writing the story? I, I I really wanted to. I was I was quite fascinated by this character of Draupadi, um, uh, as a you know as a as a Hindu kid growing up in India. I think. You know, a lot of lot of us heard of uh, the Mahabharata and Draupadi's uh, how Draupadi comes to marry five brothers is always uh, it's it stands out. Uh, it's something that um, that's quite sort of trivial almost. Uh, the, the, the story goes: uh, Arjuna, one of the brothers, uh, he wins her at a at an archery competition, and he comes home and he wants to tell his mother. He tells his mother, "Oh, I have a prize, mother." And his mother is doing something. Uh, she's busy, and she says, "Oh, good, go and share it with your brothers." So that's how she comes to marry the five brothers. Um, so Draupadi is really quite a, a. She's a very interesting figure. She's a. She's a. She, you can see she's a strong female character in the Mahabharata, but I also see her as a really a figure of conflict. She's quite a paradoxical figure because, in, on on the one hand, she's extolled as a perfect wife. She's this ideal wife. Uh, in uh, in one of the sections of the Mahabharata, she's giving advice to the second wife of Krishna, uh, Satyabhama. Satyabhama asks Draupadi how she manages to keep all her five husbands happy, and she asks quite uh, quite frankly, she says, Draupadi, tell me what is the secret of intercourse. Um, so you wait for something quite racy to come along, and you're reading along, and uh, but Draupadi is very uh, very coy about it. She says, actually, you know, this is the only secret to be a good wife. I wake up before my husband do. I cook what they like, I uh, worship them day and night, I forget my own thirst and hunger. And then she even admonishes Satyabhama for thinking of sex. She says, because I always behave like this, my husbands are attracted to me. I know of only the great things I do towards my husband, 
I don't know what the bad women do, and I don't want to know that. <clears throat> so Draupadi is this perfect wife, but on the other hand, it's Draupadi's Fate is almost a cautionary tale for a lot of women because her fate, you know, her fate of being married to the five brothers is seen as something that women should avoid at all costs. This polyandry was frowned upon in certain sections of society even then during that time. And it's definitely, I mean, pretty much unheard of uh, uh, in, you know, nowadays. And the idea of women, you know, sleeping with, you know, multiple men is something that, you know, in current society, you know, she, she would be, uh, called names like a slut, whereas for a woman to have more than one woman, one sexual partner, you know, he's a player, right? So there's, of course, a double standard. Um, so Draupadi, I feel, is a cautionary tale for women. And there, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Vedic mythology, Draupadi has to go through fire each time to, uh, to purify herself, to kind of regain her virginity. Uh, for each of her husband again and again. And there's this idea that Draupadi goes through this penance for all women, kind of it's a very Christian idea, Jiraya Christian idea of, of sacrificing yourself for the good of others. Um, uh, a lot of Hindu women, they, uh, they, are, um, they re recite the Panchakanya every morning. First thing, they're, they're supposed to wake up and re recite the Panchakanya in order to purify themselves. And purify is really a code word for regaining your virginity, right? Regaining your chastity. So this idea that Draupadi went through that, that, that penance, she sacrificed herself so that we can be pure, uh, we can be chaste. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm quite interested in Draupadi as this you know, chaste wife, but also she's married to five men. And then of course the elephant in the room is, well, what, what, what is her sex life like? Like what are the logistics of it? Like, well, how does she sort of, uh, does she, is it one brother each night? Like, how does that work? And that was something that I never asked <laughs> when I was a child, when I heard the story of Draupadi. I never even thought of asking, but um, that was something that I, I was kind of interested in uh, when I was writing the story. Um, and uh, I, I didn't do any research then, but then for this talk, I looked at uh, other reimaginings of Draupadi and there are there are plenty, you know, uh, quite erotic uh, reimaginings of her, of her sexual life with each of the five brothers. There's Elaine Aaron's uh, 1989 novel Samraj where uh, she uh, looks at, <laughs> looks in quite erotic language at how Draupadi uh, finds sexual fulfillment with each other brothers. There's a Telugu writer, uh, Yar Lagadda Lakshmi Prasad, who wrote a novel called Draupadi. Again, um, quite an erotic novel, reimagining Draupadi's uh, sexual fulfillment. Uh, and of course, that book was actually called to be banned um, by, uh, by, by many people because it was deemed obscene. Um, so when I was writing, I was, I was looking at Draupadi, but I was also looking at the, how to write about desire, because that's actually something that we're, we're quite concerned with, because de desire is something that's so interior. Uh, it's something intimate, um, and it's quite difficult to express desire. Uh, you know, there is a bad sex awards for, for, for literature where, you know, writers like, I think John Updike has got it so many times, and there's always this this danger of writing about sex because it's seen as something that's inauthentic because it's not something that can be conveyed through language because it's something that's felt really within the body, uh, within you know between two people. And I was looking at um, uh, Sangam poets. Uh, these are poets um, from uh, southern India who wrote between 300 BCE and 300 Common Era, uh, and they uh, equated ideas of love, so uh, anything, love, longing, desire, heartbreak. Uh, they equated these interior desires with the exterior landscape. So uh, flora, fauna, natural ecosystem, even things like rain or, or, or drought. So each, um, each desire to do or each feeling to do with love had its corresponding uh, landscape. And that, that, that idea was just absolutely fascinating for me. And there's of course the Kurinji flower, which is the center of my story. Um, and that's, uh, I, I lived in the Western Ghats for, four or five years of my life, but I unfortunately never saw the Kurunji bloom because it blooms only once every decade. Um, and it lives for like a month or two and then it dies. And just the poetic, uh, the metaphorical um, um, idea of that is just absolutely, it, it, there's so many poetic possibilities of this Kurunji. So these were the things that I was kind of flirting with, you know, uh, how to express longing, how to express uh, whether it's marital longing, carnal desire, passion or flirtation by looking 
outside at an exterior landscape. And that kind of brings me to um, writing sex in the time of Corona is uh, it's, it's quite, yeah, our, our notions of intimacy has really changed. Uh, our have really changed. You know, these are not just sort of sexual intimacy, but also like things like friendship or, or being, you know, close to strain, you know, when you're traveling on, on the train with a stranger, like sitting close to them. Um, it's really changed. And writing for me is a way to um, kind of regain that intimacy because what can be more intimate than putting yourself in the shoes of someone else, writing about someone else, writing about these fictional characters. Um, and that's sort of, that's really, um, uh, that's that's the power of writing, you know, because even in times where you're pretty much sitting alone in your in your house uh, without any human contact, uh, you will always have uh, have writing as a way of bridging that. So I'll uh, I'll pass the mic on to uh, yeah back to Indra and Zui. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's so true about writing and. Actually, I wanted to say after Sweta spoke that it's um, so interesting to use, and we have Sam Arnie here in the audience, so we have, it's so interesting to use myth to sort of um, help with the way we help change the current situation, and it's also a complex, um, maybe we can get into that in the discussion, but when Sweta said she was re-examining myth and sort of using this idea of a queer woman in mythology, um, I think that's so awesome and so interesting. I would love to get into that again also. Yes, that was, uh, that was a very interesting comment. So yeah. re reinventing myth, creating your own myth. You know. yeah. So we've had uh, we've had Nigga talk uh, about Fiddle Sider's uh, cow. Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm too loud. Is that all right? Uh, Fiddle Sider's cow, which he translated, which is really a story about uh, about desire about desire that is uh, repressed and it's about a desire that's secret because in expressing it she has to use it. And uh, then we had Sweta uh, talk about a desire repressed because of societal pressure. And, uh, and then we have uh, Vidya who talked about uh, uh, desire unfulfilled, right? And so um, in each of these stories, I mean, for the audience, if you go uh, to out of print, if you read them, they're really, really beautiful and very, uh, really strongly expressed. And uh, the, there's no ambiguity about what the story is about. Um, and it's always about desire. But, and, and with the power I think, uh, there's a hint of the pleasure that comes with desire. But um, but in all these stories, that is that it's it's something that's behind uh, the scenes. And so I move now to Rosalind, and I thank all of the African authors for their presentations and for being here. I thank you, Rosalind, for being part of this. It's so important to have you here. And I'd like to begin by just reading a little passage from your handbook for my lover, if I may. I don't know whether this is visible on the screen. Um, because having talked about all of these desires, uh, then we come to Rosalyn, and, um, and I'm going to read this little passage. I don't need to say anything about it. He says it. I wondered then, as I wondered now, what it was that I sought in my past lovers. Was it the lure of a good story or the thrill of seducing and being seduced? Or was it just a phase in my life, a transition? Was I trying to make, uh, I was trying to make from girl to woman? Or was I searching for fragments of myself? I know for certain that desire was at the root of this thing. I enjoyed being pursued and in indulgence I had never known as a young girl. I loved waking up in a bed not my own. I delighted in the power of my body. I reveled in the company of men and found strange comfort in the transience of the world. So I think that's such a beautiful transition, really, Rosalind. Thank you for the beautiful writing to talking about um, your way of dealing as a writer with desire and pleasure. So, so. I was really <laughs> lovely to hear that passage um, for the first time in a very long time. Sometimes the book feels, um, yeah, it feels like you know, you're touching something that you that you shed of yourself, 
Um, and every time I reread it or re encounter it, I, I'm like, oh, really? Did I write that? And it's not, I don't mean it in a way of renouncing that I wrote it. It's just sometimes I'm just surprised <laughs> that I didn't expect. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, articulating desire had so much to do with understanding my subjectivity and, and the voice. Oh, am I breaking up? Oh, yes, that's better. Yes. yes. Okay, that's, that's better. Good. I come closer yes. to the to the screen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, for me, I think there was a really important link between desire and subjectivity using the space of desire to really get at my own um, consciousness in a certain way, you know, like what is it that, um, how I felt in my body, literally. And using uh, the framework of desire to really, like as a narrative device, as something that, had, that could help me access my selfhood um, in relation um, to others. So it was really about um, finding out aspects of yourself that you could only access um, when you put yourself out there in relationship to other men or people. Um, it had this element often of like, yeah, like, um, uh, like opening the mouth of a dragon, you know, and, and, and really just exploring inside, you know, what the fire felt like, what the, um, would I even dare to do some of the things that I did in my 20s today? I'm not so sure, but I don't know if I regret any of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think so. Desire was a narrative device, but it was also a way of accessing something within me. Yes. You had said in our, uh, thank you for that. You had said actually in our, uh, you know, discussion that we had earlier when we were talking to each other, that a lot of people said to you that it was very brave and you rejected that idea because you felt uh, it was not bravery, but just something that, the need to express. But in a sense, it does take a certain conviction and belief in yourself and belief in exploring yourself uh, to be able to write about something that's difficult, I think, for society to accept, but also write about something which is rather intimate and has has that, uh, it's, it's, a it's an opening of yourself and a, and a, and a sort of a revelation. So um, if you would like to comment on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I never wanted to undermine the fact that it took a lot of courage, but I think I would so love for my book to have also been written in a world where it seemed totally normal, you know, for a woman to write like this, to be so open and so great. And, and it was also very interesting because my book at, at the back, it's very distinctly um, written that it's nonfiction and uh, erotic nonfiction. And many reviewers actually uh, wrote about the book as if it were fiction, as if it were a novel, like referring to it very often as a novel. And I think there's a kind of myth that exists right now about this book, uh, about it being fiction, and many people refer to it as a novel. And I really enjoy that. I kind of really like this, uh, that the book can exist in this ambiguous space uh, between uh, fiction and nonfiction. And it, um, I don't think it necessarily needs to commit to either one of the genres. And the best thing about it, um, you know, it, it was released in December 2015. And I think the best thing about it has been that every week I continue to get messages um, 
on Instagram, on Facebook, from people who are with women, especially who are still reading the book, a lot of queer people um, who are reading the book and, and telling me that they relate to some aspect of it. And, and that really makes me feel, it feels very validating to know that the book speaks to people in whatever way it does. It continues to have a resonance, it continues to, um, uh, to have a life, very more importantly. And I think in that sense, it's like the bravery of, and I, I wouldn't say that it's not. Um, I remember one afternoon spent at a bookstore in Bombay when I was signing copies of my book, and I was really scared to go home that day because my teacher called me and there was this kind of drama back home uh, about my book, <laughs> about the fact that I had written it. It's just something I don't think I actually ever had a conversation I have this book coming out. This is what it's about and I'd like you to know this. I I wasn't I didn't have it in me then to do that, you know, to prepare them to have a mature about it. I, I didn't feel so empowered. I just thought, um, let it come out and I'll deal with the consequences. Which I think at that time was the only strategy that I had. It was, on, it was the only thing I knew how to do. Um, I still don't really talk to my family about my writing, especially my personal writing. Um, and my, just soon after the book came out, I began to write a column for India, which I still write every Friday. And I think this was really instrumental in many people who I grew up with, including family and friends, to really understand what I was about. You know, that it wasn't that I wrote a dirty book, you know, but it was something more in a kind of political space to talk about female. And I think this has helped. And I I hope that that, you know, that is normal now or it becomes increasingly more normal for people to uh, for write books talking twice about it and not really worry about this familial angst uh, you know. yeah it's um yeah that's so interesting and listening to you speak it um it feels like all the problems arise when female sexuality is represented through the lens of pleasure rather than abuse, oppression, and violence, which is normally the way we're used to receiving it. So um, I can imagine it would have been hard to do that then, and because now it's still hard to speak about female sexuality through the lens of pleasure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, Rosalind, during our pre pre panel Zoom discussion, you'd mentioned. Um, how you're, because you wrote this amazing erotic novel, you feel like there's a unidimensional erotic lens on you as, a, as an author. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the multidimensionality, even in writing about sexuality. Sure. Yeah, it surprises me because every now and then I get a, um, a message from it at a fashion magazine, for example, saying, hey, we've got an issue coming out about sex. We'd like you to contribute, you know? And I'm like, you know, the rest of the year, it's like, I don't hear from you. And now suddenly, because you have an issue with sex, you write to me and it's a bit... And I don't mean, again, to invalidate writing about sex. I think it's a really... I mean, if I had it in me, I would. I could do it full time. You know, I would love to be even a, a Mills and Booms writer if I could. But I also write about many other things, from artistic practice to craft-based practices to, to cooking and food and, um, and and art. And I review shows and I I write intensely political pieces about um, you know the, the increase not increasing the fascist um, uh, state of affairs. Yeah, so I feel like. Um, there's a way in which people really want to put a bell on you. And I, I was recently attending a wonderful conference on Afro-modernism. Someone said it really nicely there, you know, about 
belling, uh, what it means to put a bell on you, and the belling is a label, and it's a way of making sure that you have been now tagged, and wherever, whenever you enter a space, people know, okay, this is what we expect of you. And I think people are not used to complexity. I, I mean, I think there are many, many, many complex women, but people don't want to we like to um, want to see you as one-dimensional, and it's like what Nigat uh, was talking about. You know, you are seen as a mother and only a mother, or you're seen as a grandmother and only a grandmother. You can't. You're not seen as someone who has this whole world inside you that you can that senses and smells and desires. You know, this desire and a huge aspect of personal and uh, I think especially when you're a young woman the way if you don't come from a certain caste identity uh, by virtue of the fact that you're a woman everyone wants to just take it down and everyone wants to kind of um, be that one thing and want you to perform that one thing you know for the rest of the world and it is a way of taming you it's a way of uh, taking away some of your power, it's a way of cauterizing that, that power. And it takes a lot to constantly get back. And it takes so much courage actually to, to just work towards feeling empowered enough to be able to speak up against it. And I mean, we all talk about how hard it is to be a woman in India, but it's harder still to be empowered. You know, I think about like the character story and how much there's a part of me that wants to hold that character and hug that character because I empathize so much with that character. You know, what it means to not want to be disowned, you know, what it what it means to want to have a wholeness, you know, in terms of all aspects of your life. And to, to live openly, transparent, and with pride. Um, and I think that uh, it's that's something that the world often denies you. And it takes a lot to understand that you don't have to invalidate yourself just because other people do. Um, for me, that was the biggest thing in the last couple of years. Like, yeah, I would love it. I would have loved it if my book had come, had got more, um, you know, uh, it, it, some awards or something like that, because it would have helped sales, for example. But I love the fact that my book has had its own secret life, that it continues to be in circulation, and uh, people continue to educate about it. I learn, I mean, in many ways, a writer. I books to earn money <laughs> so little, but um, but you have this feeling that there is this afterlife of this experience that was you and this part of you that you know was flesh and blood and sweat and oil. And um, there is something really wonderful and about that. And I mean, you're talking about what it means, what intimacy means in Corona times. It's it's also that feeling of holding a book. And that, that, that really writing by women about desire really has that attached to it. I'm, um, I'm sort of focusing on a word that you mentioned, which is this, the secret life of your book. And uh, in a way, so much about uh, sexuality is a secret life as well. And uh, Vidya, you touched upon uh, the, um, the words that you use to talk about uh, eroticism and sexuality. Uh, it's, very, it's very hard to do. I think uh, uh, something like happiness or something like pleasure, they're extremely difficult to actually convey in words. And um, I was very curious about that, and I'm going to take a moment to just tell a little story, uh, which is I was talking to someone in my family who's uh, uh, older than I am and is definitely not a prude. She's one of the very open people I know. And she was talking about uh, a couple, uh, as a young girl, she had gone to one of the villages uh, connected to the family, and uh, she had come across uh, this uh, 
a female couple who presumably were lovers. One didn't know, but she said, you know, as a young girl, I just picked up that there was scandal associated with that family, you know, and nobody really spoke about what it was. And there was, there was, there was this secret sort of life that was in that family. And but while speaking to me about it, she couldn't use the word uh, lesbian, not because she's approved, nor because she's unaware of the word. She has, you know, lesbian friends too. But it was only because I think in a way, the narrowing down of the complexity of that relationship to something that we understand in the modern world as a lesbian couple didn't ring true. And so I was just curious about these words. And also, Vidya, in your story, when you talk about um, the husband who's uh, unable to fulfill his wife, who's impotent, uh, you know, you talk about his genitalia and you use uh, the, uh, uh, the analogy of the lotus and the lotus pad and the lotus bloom lying on the water, uh, you know. And I thought that was so beautiful, actually, and extremely evocative of the... Uh, of, of just the physicality of his body. And uh, so I, I think it's finding words and crafting talking about desire, which as we have said many times already is, is such an intimate experience. Now, I would just love to hear any of your comments on, on that. Rosalind, would you like to go first since you've actually written uh, about desire so uh, beautifully in, um, in your handbook for my lover? Uh, sorry, I just missed a little bit of that because I was looking to see if there was anything in the, in the questions uh, and I got distracted. Um, just can you, uh, you talked about the complexity or uh, not wanting to pin down the complexity of the relationship. And then after that, you talked about oh. Vidya's story and, sorry. And I talked about Vidya's story and I talked about words. I talked about words, you know, what words do you use to write about desire and how complicated it is to express that. So if anybody has a comment and if we don't, we can just move ahead to talk about something else and come back to it. So it's no problem. <laughs> Yeah. No, it, it's it is a really beautiful question because I think it's the it's the hardest thing to do to use mm -hmm. words that are not like burdened by cliche and to use words that really can communicate um, subtleties and sen the sensuousness of desire. And sometimes I think it has more to do, you know, when we focus on the word aspect of it, it becomes about semantics and language. And I really think it's about feeling. I think it's about how the writer feels, like how the writer experiences their being. And as a result of which, how they're able to pass that on um, into the subjectivities of their characters. And I think that's the really wonderful part of it. Like when I read Clarice Lispector, for example, even when she's not speaking about sex, you know, she's just talking about a character. She just does it with so much erotic potential in the words. You know, it's this kind of energy that travels through a text and it makes the text breathe um, as if it's really alive and you can hear it and you can you can see it heaving and I think uh, so much about desire is also about that like being able to clue plug into that and I also want to add that, um, this 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 uh, in my story I guess I compared the husband's genitalia or, or the the the, the, uh, the character she compares her husband's genitalia to a lotus pad and it was um well, you know, it, the funny thing is, it's actually female desire that kind of, it's quite difficult to come up with metaphors because I feel like the, the, the terrain is quite kind of not really explored. You know, if you look at male, the male gaze, the woman is this bud, you know, taking, it's, uh, there's, a, you know, if you look at like a tumble cinema, like it's, there's, there's, there's this rose bud and that's sort of, uh, that's code for, you know, taking a woman's virginity. So there's, there's a, there, there, there's a lot of, um, uh, metaphors and images and symbolism to do with the male gaze and how the male, how a man sees a woman's body, um, uh, the petals of a flower, etc. But I think it's quite difficult to, for a, for, for a female desire to express that. And I think that's quite, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard work to come up with imaginative 
symbols, imaginary metaphors, and not to, um, like you said, Rosal, not to get burdened uh, by cliches. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the words are, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it feels like it's quite a new terrain. It's, uh, it feels like you're uh, exploring something very new. But at the same time, perhaps it isn't because we have um, Firdaus Heather's story that was written in, what year exactly was it written in, Nigar? <laughs> Oh, I think she's on. Nigat, you're on mute, I think. Um, yeah, sorry. So it was published in 1982, um, but uh, so I would think that she was writing it maybe uh, 1980, 81. Yeah. Something Perhaps like that. Yeah. We're so afraid of it, of female pleasure. And um, also, when Rosalind was speaking about the unidimensionality, I think it's because, um, again, female pleasure is such a taboo subject for us. When it comes up and when there's erotic writing, we sort of put blinders onto the rest of the world and that's all we see it for. And we, um, and so our language then becomes limited because um, mm -hmm. we are sort of held to that, held to that limitation. Mm -hmm. And yet when you think back, well, with Sam here in the audience, I think, uh, you know, when you think back to... Um, 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 well, I was going to say mythological, but that wasn't what I meant. Think back to writing from earlier times, uh, writing from a couple of centuries ago. Um, um, there was very explicit writing about mm -hmm. desire and uh, from the Tanjo courts, for example, and uh, ascribed now to courtesans, but were they or were they not? I mean, or was it written by a poet? Whatever it is, there was very explicit, very... Uh, erotic, very filled with feeling writing uh, in Telugu poetry and in Tamil poetry and so on and so forth. So it's not as if it in Indian literature, this has not been um, examined, but we go through these waves of prudishness and repression and, you know, all the complexity of the patriarchal um, uh, view of uh, where women and how women are. Uh, but I don't know whether we should look back to those writings also to see um, where the erotic uh, emerges there. So I'd really like to um, respond to that. There was this book that I I could only carry a few books with me when I moved to Italy, and this is one. It's called Walking Me. Uh, women, Society, Spirituality in South India. And I happen to find this in a bookshop in Calcutta. It's by Vijaya Ramaswamy. And it's a really brilliant book because it talks about how um, historically uh, a lot of women used spirituality as a form of empowerment and as a way of asserting their erotic lives and dignity. And this is also really important because there's this whole domain of spirituality in which women actually expressed erotic agency outside of cis heterosexual norms, you know, which had not to do with an actual man, but had to do with, with like the divine power or divine energy and I think that's a really wonderful um, segment of writing you know this bridal mysticism uh, I find a lot beyond the courtesans and and that kind of writing I think there's a lot of power in this spiritual discourse which is actually erotic and by courtesans, I didn't mean in a, a, a it's a difficult complex word. I meant the whole culture of the, the Devdasi culture, which is an extreme. No, I, I, I think I understood also what you meant, because like, for example, there's that beautiful book written by a courtesan, like uh, The Appeasing of Radhika, which is really, 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 really beautiful and like, to get back. So, but that is also, I think it's a genre in itself, uh, which is not so explored, uh, just like, you know, women and spirituality is not so explored. I think the courtesan culture is really important because it was one space in which women actually got a certain kind of more explicit agency than in most other cases. Like you really were allowed to learn, you were allowed access to education, you were actually encouraged to have your own mind, uh, which is uh, which is which is very empowering. So I think that I think of these as different kinds of genres, which are which remain unexplored. I think. 
can I <clears throat> can I add a uh, comment here? Uh, if that's okay. <clears throat> I think what's happened, the tragedy of our times is that the erotic, uh, you know, has been reduced to the pornographic. And uh, that is really tragic. Uh, it, it, so I, I was reading this essay by Audre Lorde called The Uses of the Erotic. And uh, I highly recommend that people who have not read it, please read that essay. Uh, she calls the erotic a creative uh, life force, especially in the lives of women. And she says that it's been relegated to the bedroom and to just sex, you know, whereas the erotic, it, the word erotic comes from the word eros, which means love. And she says that it should permeate, it, if it's allowed to permeate all aspects of our life, you know, as Rosalind was saying, even the mystical tradition where there's longing and uh, seeking the beloved, you know, the beloved can be a divine beloved, but not necessarily. I mean, if you read a lot, it is very erotic in nature. If you read Rumi's Masnavi, I mean, Rumi was in love with his uh, mentor, uh, Shams, uh, Shams Tabriz, you know, they had a very, I mean, it's all been uh, pushed under the carpet because we don't want to talk about these spiritual figures also being erotic. So the erotic is almost <clears throat> like a spiritual, um, it can be on a spiritual uh, plane and it can really come from our very deepest part of our uh, existence, you know, but we have, uh, we've trivialized it. We've just sort of, uh, uh, <clears throat> Audrey Lord calls it the plasticized sensation. And she says that pornography uh, is a denial of the erotic, you know, and she says that what pornography emphasizes <clears throat> is simply sensation without the feeling. <clears throat> and the erotic is about feeling. I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't, uh, the, for me, uh, the, the tilt of your beloved's head or uh, the softness in her voice as she's reading a poem can be an extremely erotic experience. So it requires us to engage our imagination, our hearts, you know, the heartful imagination. And it's unfortunate <clears throat> that we've reduced it simply to a sensation and to pornography. So. And I just want to add, I think our, our, I think what I feel um, when I look at um, pornography also has kind of transcended what we think of as porn. Anything can be called pornography now, you know, um, there was this case with this uh, Tamil poet who wrote about Andal and Devadasi culture, and that was deemed pornography. And that was, uh, that was, that was enough for it to be uh, burned and, you know, uh, banned and etc. So I think to, to, to really draw the line between pornography and erotic literature, it's it's such a fluid line. And it's a line that kind of shifts depending on who's looking at it, right? Pornography can be, you know, uh, a kiss can be pornographic um, for some people. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a, you know, flash of a nipple. It's very, it's uh, it's really sort of uh, people's sen sensibilities shift when it comes to thinking about you know what is what exactly is where where where, where did it, what is pornography what is erotic what is just you know what is chaste uh, what is chastity. Yeah, I just want to add over there also. I guess speaking from the generation of Tinder, I think what if our um, our relationship with sexuality has become more detached, and what if um, this is we use different words and it is more about just sensation i think that's i think that's okay i think to be aware that the mystical relationship is possible and that spiritual realm exists is a beautiful thing but i think also to transition into a new space that's a little bit more detached we, we live in a cyber world we're all speaking right now on zoom um we have to sort of navigate these new waters um as well with the with um, with the same sensitivity and understanding as before, because I suppose humans are still seeking connection in some form, but um, perhaps the depths of that have changed, or I'm not sure. But yeah, if anybody would like to comment on that, or I think I'd like to bring in uh, something that doesn't often get talked about when we talk about desire, which is actually violence. Um, in most um, instances in writing by women in India that that works within the realm of desire, the desire is either a counter to violence or it's a way of 
refuge uh, in a space of violence. And I think in each of the each of your stories, and I think certainly in my book, I mean there are many. There is a backdrop of violence, and I think what we are trying to talk about is when we talk about the life force is the thing that counters the violence. Um, and I mean, violence that's often not even perceived as violence. For example, in Shweta's story, the father um, separating the two girls, like literally separating them without even affording them the dignity of a goodbye or the dignity of knowing what's happen happening. It's this patriarchal figure is kind of enacting a decision, uh, you know, top down without understanding consent. And I think that uh, even when it comes to Tinder uh, and, and the way sex is navigated today, I'm, I'm, a lot of it excites me in terms of how people are advocating their agency, but I think we haven't yet, or we haven't talked enough about what it means to consent to something or to offer consent. And we haven't spoken about the enthusiasm of con consent, like what is enthusiastic consent? You know, for a woman to not just agree, to, okay, I have sex with you, but to be excited about having sex or for a man for that matter, to be excited about pleasure, to be excited to have pleasure as something mutual. And I think we haven't even spoken enough about what it means for an equality of pleasure, you know, for men to want to pleasure a woman, not because he has to, but because he wants to, because he wants, you know, for example. Um, and I think that there are all of these completely, um, there's so many of these uncharted territory um territories within the domain of, of desire and sex when it comes to um, the Indian landscape. And, and I think it's important to constantly remember that. I think it's important to remember the violence of not being, uh, not, not being sexually satisfied by your partner. You know, the violence of being an older person who is denied the even uh, being seen as a sexual being or or what it means for a person who's differently abled, you know, to not be seen as a person in, in, in who, who desires or who desires to be desired or what it means for queer sexuality to often have to articulate itself in opposition to family. And what it means for a woman to say, okay, I want this, um, you know, and when I say woman here, I don't mean biologically defined women. I mean, like, you know, women as a very, very broad, constantly And I think it's important to remember this violence against which we're all performing. That's a, that's a really important point. Thank you, Rosalind. I mean, I was taken to a story that we published again in the March 2015 issue of Out of Print, which was by Vasudendra, who's a writer in Kannada. Uh, uh, his work was translated and we published it. And it's about a, uh, it's again, a brilliant story. I mean, the way, uh, actually, I think, firstly, I mean, I comment quickly in an aside that fiction is an extraordinary way to address many of these issues. And this is an extraordinary story again. And I was reminded uh, of Sveta's story again, because it's set in a small town and it's about a young man who's gay and um, the extraordinary consequences of his being bold and expressive about it, completely tied to violence and the violence of his own family, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, um, it's a very, very important point to make, actually, because um, it is connected to everybody's inability to express themselves as well, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's so interesting that you used violence as a word for women not um, receiving pleasure from their partners. I, that's, I'm going to use that. That's awesome. Um, but uh, um, I just like to ask all of you, um, as as women writing about as writing about anything uh, coming from India, do you feel a responsibility towards changing the narrative as it exists right now? And are you aware of that responsibility while creating? 
And I guess, okay, this is sort of a two part question, but um, do you also feel in these times and with what we were just speaking about sort of people becoming a little bit more detached from this understanding of, from their own desire and sort of moving into a more um, insular space. Do you also feel there's a shift from the visceral to the cerebral and um, how, if you do, how do you navigate that? And while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to ask uh, Lekha, if we have any questions, then you can, uh, yeah, there's one. Okay. So when we finished with this, maybe we can raise that. And in the, we have now an audience of uh, more, two more, about seven or something. So we have a couple of questions from our audience as well. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, okay. If you'd like to respond to Zoe, yeah. go ahead. Respond. Uh, okay, sorry. I, I, if no one's going ahead, I can quickly uh, summarize or res my response to it. I think for me, uh, I think personally as a writer, uh, it, I'm always aware of this notion of responsibility uh, towards my characters, towards me, if I emerge as a character because I frequently write in the eye, um, because I write memoir. Um, what does it mean? What is, uh, who am I speaking to? Very often I'm actually trying to resolve for myself. Like I'm trying to, and a lot of my writing is often coming out of that sense of um, questioning and insight and unlearning. Um, and I think that I definitely perceive it as a responsibility. And I, I always hope a lot of the writers that I read to some of those uh, standards that I, I like to about is applying to myself as well. I am interested in seeing characters that are more uh, empowered also. I, I'm, I'm, these days I've been really thinking about popular culture and how we perceive men, you know. I'm so interested to see um, well-rounded male characters, you know, and what empowered male characters look like, you know, and how they, and I think so much of our conversation often uh, have been to each other and speaking to each other. And sometimes I feel like we've completely excluded men from the conversation. And I, I, I think I try to make it more inclusive or to reach out, you know, in a way that helps me. And sometimes there are days when I have the energy to do it and there are days when I don't have the energy to do it. So I'm also conscious of what those boundaries are. And I think in terms of shift from the visceral to the cerebral, um, I'm not entirely sure about that because, uh, but I also don't want, I mean, my experience over the last couple of months has been extremely unique in a certain way because it's while lockdown was happening, I was shutting down my apartment of like 10 years in Delhi and, um, and, and, and giving away all my things. And, and I just had to very abruptly relocate uh, to Italy for various uh, visa related issues uh, to my partner's house and uh, I live here with his parents and with him and uh, you know we got married last year and then we did a church wedding this year it's been a very different experience for me it's been an experience of dislocation because I couldn't even say goodbye to my my best friends my family um, I couldn't take a lot of things that I would have liked to like spices and every day I I encounter new cravings that I didn't have before for the most random things. So it's, it's, it's been a very, I've been feeling my body in a way that I haven't felt before. And I think uh, I live in a place that's very, very rooted in nature. It's very, um, it's a really beautiful place, but it's also an economy where people are constantly taking care of each other, giving each other things. There's a lot of plant life and uh, like what I call more than human life um, that I'm more, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more and more interested in. So and, and I, I think we should also be wary of thinking that the cerebral exists without the visceral or that the visceral can exist without the cerebral. You know, it's the same thing. I think we, we don't live one dimensional life. I think we're, and I think it's important to keep tapping into all of these different components of how we how we experience ourselves and the world around us. So 
Can I just add a little bit to what Rosalind was saying about um, uh, living a very cerebral life because you know we are uh, we are we are we don't really have much contact with others. Uh, this year has just been completely different, in, in a way. For I, I I can only speak for myself, but it's it's been a lot of writers kind of live in their own minds a lot. Uh, uh, so it's 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 been kind of great to uh, not have to commute, not have to, uh, I, I'm also studying at the moment, so to not have to sit in this lecture hall and listen to this lecture. So it's really quite, uh, you know, I, I have actually written much more than uh, this year than I have, you know, in the past, partly because I think of the lockdown, because uh, it gives you this space, it gives you a, a proverbial room of your own to think, you know, yes, I have, you know, my kid running around uh, all day long, but it's still, it's still, um, it's a, it's a bit of a different experience because now you have the license to retreat into yourself. It's it's okay now because everyone's doing it. You don't have to uh, be ashamed of it or you don't have to apologize to anyone. Thank you, yes, that's a good point. Sveta, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, I think I can agree with them in saying that I don't really see a shift towards a cerebral uh, way of writing. I think that, well, I'm from a, I'm a creative writing student. So we discuss writing a lot in class and there is this really strong insistence that our writing should be rooted in the sensory and that the, our writing should be rooted in images. And so I think that this uh, situation has kind of made it harder for uh, me and for other writer friends that I have. Uh, they found it a bit harder to write uh, because they don't really get to go anywhere and they are locked in the same space. So I think that's a bit different from uh, the experience, uh, experience like that uh, Vidya uh, conveyed. But like, um, I certainly don't think that um, it's moving to a more cerebral space. And as for the first question, I do think that I feel that like there is a responsibility when I'm writing uh, stories. I'm really focused on creating a space for myself and for uh, like more like more discussions on queer sexuality when I'm writing my stories and when I'm writing uh, poetry. So I am uh, I do feel like it should be normalized. I feel like um, so there is a responsibility when I'm uh, writing stories. Nika, I mean, we talked about your uh, relationship with uh, the, uh, the topic today through Firdaus's writing, but you're a writer in your own right. And so, uh, yeah, you could respond in that, respond in that sense. We can't hear you. Again, you have to unmute yourself, uh, Nika. Sorry, um, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, just like Vidya said, I think the lockdown has been um, yeah, it's just given the space and time uh, to, uh, I think I started observing my, because we can't go out that much and so on. So I just observed little things in my uh, immediate environment, you know, it's just made me a more acute observer. So I noticed that a particular bulbul comes every morning and sits on the topmost branch of the Ashok tree when I'm having my coffee outside. And I never noticed this before, why? Uh, and I noticed that a pair of sparrows uh, have had their babies and uh, uh, they built their nest very close to my bedroom window. Um, and I, I find myself sitting there for hours just watching them hop from the nest to the little window ledge where I put out some bird seed. And, and so things like that is just, I think it's made me um, go more into myself. And uh, I don't think I've become a more cerebral person any more than... I was, in fact, I think I, I notice a lot of my new things in my environment a lot more acutely. So yeah, good for writing. <laughs> Shall we take audience questions? I was just, for people in the audience here, it might be nice for our panelists to see them. Could they just come up and do the question here, with the, if you don't mind? The podium. Yeah, could you go to the podium to take your question? Thank you, thank you. And then we have a question uh, that's come in from Zoom, I think. So, yeah. Thanks so much. It's been a really terrific uh, session. Really enjoyed listening to it so far. Um, every, everything was uh, a lot of food for thought. Uh, one thing that um, Vidya mentioned 
uh, brought a question to my mind and, and Sam, you're gonna have to forgive me for not knowing the answer to this, but when you were talking about Draupadi, uh, you said that, um, uh, and the different relationships, I blanked out completely on her maternal uh, profile. Does she have children and from which of her husbands? And the reason I'm asking that was because of the, that relationship um, or that dichotomy between sexual, she's a sexual person, but she's also chaste. And so much of um, uh, the way one looks at a woman uh, or culture looks at a woman uh, as a uh, being is as a potential mother mm -hmm. uh, or as a maternal being. And of course, that's related to sexuality. So that's my question. It's kind of to all of you. Um, oh, but Sam, if you want to answer the Draupadi question, that's it. Um, does anyone have a, a, an answer to the Draupadi question, but also to the whole relationship between a woman and her, uh, um, she's a procreating vessel in many cultures. And so what does that have to do with her as a um, sexual being? Um, I actually, I, I, I do believe Draupadi had children. Um, she had many children and I think she uh, had children with all of her husbands. I, 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 I'm not an expert. So uh, I did a little bit of research on this. Um, so is that right? Yes. Sam says all the children die. Oh, please do come. Um, Sam says at the end of Mahabharata, they all burn to death. So, but, <laughs> thanks for that. but um, um, yeah, I also read that she had children, but it was, um, she was still viewed as this very chaste person. And I don't know if this is true. I'm again, just guessing, but she was like, she had like a certain period of time with each brother. So it was never, she wasn't enjoying them all at, at once. I don't know if she was enjoying them at all. <laughs> Um, I, I did read that she had a, one brother per every year. She sort of rotated through the brother. So one year she got uh, Bhima, one year she got uh, Arjuna, etc. So, th so there are sort of conflicting reports on this. Um, I'm not quite sure how she rotated, but she she was. I mean, presumably, if, if one has children, you know, one is sexually active. I think that's some that's uh, that's an assumption we can make. But yeah, it is quite interesting. It almost seems like once a woman becomes a mother, she sort of her, 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 her job as a sexual being is done and she becomes someone who's, uh, who's chaste, you know, who takes his vow of chastity. Um, I think in a lot of Hindu culture, there's also this uh, practice of uh, women don't eat, women who have already had kids, they don't eat onions or garlic because they're considered aphrodisiacs. Uh, I don't know if uh, this kind of, this, this, this sounds familiar um, to anyone. Uh, so it's sort of, you know, because your, 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 your job is done, basically, you're, 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 you're sexual, you have been sexual, uh, you know, you have had kids, and therefore you're, you know, you kind of can retire from a life, from a sexual life, is sort of the, the idea behind that. Um, yeah, that's actually a very, very uh, interesting point. I uh, probably worth exploring actually to go back to see where that was, uh, um, where that didn't follow the norm in, mytholo in mythology and other stories. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess. Um, uh, in, go ahead. Oh, no, we'll take another question. I just want to end really quickly with this thought of like writing about mythology and sexuality. Do you feel a danger considering the current state of things in this uh in this place um <laughs> i i actually haven't shown my story to my mother uh i haven't told her that i'm giving this talk or, or anything at all so i i yes i definitely uh do worry um my mother is very religious and she uh she will be very upset <laughs> to know that i have uh Reimagine Draupadi as someone with 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 with, with you know with needs with pleasure. Um, so uh, yes, I do I do worry a lot about about writing about this, and it's not just the sexual life of a woman, but it's also sort of giving uh, her the agency. It's 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 very it's very difficult um, to it's it's sort of a it's like, it's like walking on eggshells. I feel. Um, uh, but it, or even sort of writing about things like menstruation uh, or writing about. Um, 
about um, or the lack, you know, of desire for your for your husband or writing about extramarital relationship. It's very, it's uh, yeah, it's it's something that's awkward. I mean, I'm not that I'm ashamed of, of my writing, but I, I there, you know, it's, it's really for a, yeah, I feel sometimes like I'm preaching to the converted because I would not dare show my work to, uh, to someone who I know would, you know, disagree with, with the fundamentals of it. Yet, if you think back to say Andal's poetry translated by uh, Ravi Shankar and Priya Sadaka Chabria, I mean, it's so explicit, and she talks about uh, menstruation. She's, you know, it's it's extraordinary where we've come. There's a question from the uh, from the from. Yes. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we'll take one question from the audience. Uh, it's from Kirtana, mm -hmm. and uh, she's interested in uh, knowing the speaker's feelings about how or whether language will change in the years ahead, given how sex and sexuality is filtered through the new dating platforms, like Grindr, Tinder, Bumble, etc. That's my mom, by the way. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Keithana. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 um, I can't answer that actually, in a way, because I I don't I don't uh, use the language. I I haven't needed to go on dating platforms in recent times. <laughs> and <clears throat> but I'm I am curious actually because it is such a present uh, uh, experience in in the current times. So if anybody would like to respond to that, the the all of you guys. Please. And, and, and you too, I Perhaps, mean, and, yeah. and audience. Yeah, and audience. So, Zoe, you have to go. Yeah, well, first, I just want to say that uh, it means a lot to me that my mom is here at this panel about writing on sex. And um, I think it's it's so important. I think it's, it's I was watching... Um, Kim Kardashian on David Letterman this morning and she, Thank spoke you, about, Zoe. <laughs> and she spoke about how when her sex video came out she went to her grandmother and was that's how she was supported during the time and I think that's really such an important thing and such a necessary um, thing to have especially in India as an intergenerational conversation about sex and sexuality so it becomes a safer space so there's less violence so we um, we don't have to worry about those things as much um, whether the language will change, yes, I think definitely. I think the language has um, become much more immediate. I think my, um, in my own writing, my expression of desire has become much more, perhaps to the point and, and faster. Everything is slightly more rapidly paced. And um, I feel that even with music, I feel um, it's become perhaps more an isolated experience in these times. Um, and I do feel a shift more from the history. That's why um, when uh, Nigat mentioned um, just it becoming just a sensory experience, I, I do feel that as a, as a reality. And I wonder about the, the reasons behind it. But um, I think the, the world has, has led us to this new space that's worth um, really tearing apart and exploring a little bit more. So yes, definitely the language has, has changed, mm -hmm. I think. But I would imagine in a way language does often respond to uh, the times, right? That is the kind of incredible fluidity of, this, of the written and the spoken word. So uh, the magic of that, it's more what we feel, which will be also interesting to, to examine moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add to the um, in on reply to the question is what what the dating platforms are doing. Um, one would have hoped that you know they would really democratize the space in which people would meet uh, different people from different um, regions and so on and cut across all the cultural and social and caste and all these uh, differences. But that's unfortunately not happening. So the ageism is alive, you know, the casteism is alive. Um, I heard from one man um, who was on Grindr uh, saying that very specifically it's listed like, don't respond if you're a Muslim, you know, 
Um, so all of these things, I mean, I don't really know if we are making much progress or, uh, or the inherent, you know, um, uh, prejudices and biases that we have as a culture uh, are just being, um, you know, magnified on, on these platforms. So that's something to... Sam, you had a question? Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Uh, I think it was, I mean, just also interesting because I don't think, I think dating platforms have just made it obvious on some level that it's not really about another person. It's what uh, Nagath was talking about earlier, the power of eros. We just keep projecting it and swiping right and swiping left in the hopes of finding something that doesn't actually exist. Uh, but I wanted to actually, I mean, when Nagath was mentioning this Audre Lord essay that I'd never read, I was Googling on my phone, the power of technology and reading it at the same time she was talking. Mm -hmm. But my question is for her, actually, it is for all of the, um, the, the, the panelists, what is this eros? Um, what is this longing? Is it actually something that we're looking for within ourselves? Some self, I mean, an expression of ourselves that hasn't come out as yet? Or is it really a longing for another person? That's something that I myself, when I look at this Bumble Tinder generation and I'm part of it, I wonder, um, so I, I was just curious to get your responses about that. How much of sexual longing is less about a body or a, or a, or a person and is more a projection of one's own, yeah, potential? Oh, hi, camera. <laughs> um, you know, um, in, in Urdu poetry, um, the longing that uh, the lover has for a beloved, uh, it's never supposed to uh, result in a union. You know? So that lo the longing, is the, the whole idea of this journey of setting out on a quest for the beloved is that it is unattainable. It is unattainable. And so we find many, uh, um, you know, um, substitutes for it. I mean, it could be through your work or through your art or through your, and even through another person, but ultimately in the ultimate sense, you can only find it within yourself. And um, that's why it's unattainable. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, that's my take on it. Um, I actually have a very different take on it, which is, um, when I, because I've been uh, for my the sequel to a handbook for my lover, I've been thinking a lot about um, what are the things that connect mysticism and uh, my 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 interest in mysticism, my interest in cooking, and, and, and for me it becomes the um, the structure of the tongue, and I I'm using the tongue to explore that and I'm using the tongue also in terms of female irrepressibility and actually someone in, uh, asked a question online about how do we make things more mainstream and I think it's this whole thing about talking about it you know like literally constantly talking even if it feels like no thing because we're all like murmuring and if our murmurs become loud enough it reaches, you know, there is that sense. But I'm interested in the eros in, in terms of a space of joy. Um, and I feel personally as a feminist, uh, I have kind of rejected this notion of happiness because I see it as tied to capitalist practice, you know, of consuming and how do we consume other bodies how do we consume culture you know even tinder beyond a point or a dating app is, a, is an act of consumption you're finding a way to consume other people or you know and i'm not interested so much in in consumption i think i'm interested more in states of of flow in states of uh of joy and I think that is why for me it always goes back to the self because it, it has to be that self that is full or that is constantly refilling itself you know and constantly there's a sense of vision and I like the idea of writing as spill you know like you spill over you you, you connect and you spill and you 
And I'm interested really in the ecstasy that comes from that. And I think sometimes that's what connects different strands of um, writing. And I've, I've, it, this has been a thought in my head a lot about the, the, the feeling of crisis when it comes to the present era that we're living in, which has its own hubris attached to it. Um, but sometimes I think it's like, you know, the Titanic sinking. And everyone's talked about how the Titanic sunk. But I'm very interested in that visual of that orchestra that continued playing music while the Titanic was sinking. And I really find that this, uh, there's something to unpack about that image. You know, what does it mean to continue to play a violin when you know you're 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 sinking and you know that you are, and you can either fall into despair in that fatalism, or you can sing and I think I'm interested in that what is it that that makes us want to sing and I think that is where I locate Eros. Fascinating I mean yes as you were think as you were talking about it in fact the word that kept coming to my mind was uh, you know some again it's one of these ambiguous overused kind of words so I don't really know what it means but that that creative impulse, you know, the thing is I never feel, I feel unhappy when I'm unable to go and do something creative or to write. And oftentimes the writing is, you, you just toss it away because it's not been good, but, but I'm unhappy when I don't actually experience that, you know, in a sense, it's that urge, which is within, which is, which is where you find fulfillment too. And so, which is not to say there aren't other wondrous fulfillments, but this is one of them, so yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> Leka is indicating that we are out of time. I, uh, I just wanted, sorry, I just wanted to say there were a lot of uh, very lovely questions. Yes, yeah, okay, I do, I do. I'm, people, how, is there a way that they Yes, I, I do see that there are lots of questions and we are a little bit uh, impaired here by being unable to manage them ourselves. Uh, what do you suggest, Leka? Perhaps we could send email responses to the to the questions. Yes, yes, and that, oh, maybe oh, do you have a these? This will be projected on YouTube as well, isn't it, or something like that? It'll be accessible, so maybe we can actually make the responses uh, public, and so that uh, we can continue the, the the this discussion. I think that would actually make it interesting. Yes. Yes, but what would might be nice would be actually for everyone else who's been listening in to actually participate in the discussion around the question too. So yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Leka. Well, oh. It would have been lovely to take the questions, but we'll yes. carry it for can we? There's no way. Huh. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now? Just right now? Right away. Oh. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. There's no way to send that link to the people who've asked the questions. Okay, so, lovely. whoever wants to stay, please do stay. Yes. And um, we'll try and we'll try and get some questions in. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ravi. Yeah. That's very, Thank you very so generous. Thank you. Also, Raghu and Lekha. Okay, okay, so we'll take the questions of yeah, and if any of the panelists feel uh, the need to sort of drop out, feel free. But it'd be lovely if you stayed on, actually. Um, okay, Urvashi K, her question isn't related to the session, she, sa she says, um, but uh, in a general sense, what is the major difference between commercial erotica or literature erotica? As apparently she also writes erotic short stories, but she's unaware of any platform that publishes it. Yeah, we can't hear you so well. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Do you want to read out like a few questions and then we can we can deal with them? Because actually the thing is, maybe you 
can all see the questions. Um, yeah, we well, can't. may I request the panelists to pick any questions that may interest them because a lot of them are comments, not questions. I, I'm happy to answer this question about commercial versus literary. Uh, honestly, I think it's really a question of how much you get paid for it. And when it's commercial, you get paid a lot more for it. <laughs> Is what I would say. The moment it's literary, you don't get paid so much. Um, and I'm actually really invested. I really don't subscribe to these um, hierarchies that we keep constructing around like you know what is high art and what is low art and I, I think this has been a way to exclude many people and to make you know intellectual discourse a very um elitist exercise so i think that we just need lots of women writing in every domain i mean we need more women writing mills and booms novels we need more women like in uh, in beauty magazines and stuff like that i really think that it's really about a plurality of voices and i yeah mm -hmm well said i mean there there is i think also a reader a reader discerns what they find works for them and so apart from the actual uh, economic aspect of things it's where you find yourself comfortable reading and what interests you whether you need things to be told explicitly whether you need them to be subtle and nuanced all of those things i think writers play with and readers have to play with as well so Yes, and so uh, another question. You guys can read them. We can't. So, well, can we can we bring the chat up on the side here on the screen? Okay. 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 So, if any of um, if you find a question that you would like to address, um, please read it out and then address it. Uh, Nigat is saying something on yeah. the thing, on the chat. Um, in the meantime, I think it's really interesting what Rosalind said about this distinction between high art and whatever, low art, mm -hmm. and it being this sort of exclus exclusionary system, because I think there's always this danger of intellectualizing things and missing out on a very uh, essential quality of creating. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, there's, there are uh, two questions that came up that I think are really interesting. Uh, one is about uh, BDSM and the other is about uh, the role of pain and humiliation in sexuality. And I actually find these really interesting questions, especially because I think writing is one of those spaces where one can really explain your fantasy and I think there are so many women I've had so many conversations with my friends who would love to be, um, you know know more about what BDSM is or how do you explore it and I think uh, being in a really in a loving relationship it doesn't I'm not subscribing that it has to be a monogamous relationship or heterosexual relationship but I just mean a loving respect is a very wonderful space to explore so much of our desire and sometimes the desire could be for um, for pain or humiliation uh, within a sexual um, encounter and then how do you frame safe words how do you you know I think this was one thing that I felt um, I never felt I could explore as a woman in India because I would be raped <laughs> and I think that's really sad because when you have this constant backdrop of violence you can't explore so many things to be satisfying to the parties involved um yeah I just wanted to address those because I thought they were really lovely questions mm -hmm. Thank you. um Nigat, did you did Nigat leave? I mean, I think she said something on the chat, but we can't read it, and so I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I can read for you what she says. Uh, she just says, "Wonderful to be part of the panel." Okay, sorry, I'm still here. Yeah, uh, there you are. Was there a question for me? I just. Uh, no, no, I saw it. 
you wrote something, so I wasn't sure what it was, and we can't read it for. Oh, I just uh, thanked everybody for the wonderful uh, yes. uh, discussion. Yes. And I think somebody in the audience commented that it's we just barely scratched the surface. And I agree that uh, there's just so much more that we need to talk about all the various aspects and various expressions of sexual yeah. desire. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I wrote in the comments. Uh, there was one more thing that I thought maybe I would love to hear from the others. It's a question to comment that came in about um, what we inherit in terms of sexuality from our mothers. Um, I thought this was a really nice question. I'd love to know if you have any, if you guys have anything to say about it. Well, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting question. And uh, 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 I can, uh, of course, speak for myself, but I, I got absolutely zero sex education from my from my mother, uh, uh, and and you know even now sort of it's not something that's you know even addressed addressed at all. Like and I mean you know, I have kids and uh, it's uh, it's almost like uh, sex is sex does not exist. Um, and I I hope I mean I'm a mother as well, and I hope I uh, am different. I hope I. Uh, make sure that my daughter and my son have uh, very, very healthy notions of, of, of sexuality, of sex, of, uh, you know, what is consent and what is respect. And uh, so it's, it's something that I, I, I'm thinking of, you know, like how I grew up and I want to, I want to basically not, not have the same experience being, you know, perpetuated for, for the, for the next generation. I think Zoe, in your story that uh, look me in the eye, I think you address that very beautifully where you talk about how uh, you, uh, oh, I don't have my computer to actually quote your line, but which is basically that you talk about sex with your parents and you know, you have this wonderful line describing how you, uh, your character is perceiving mm -hmm. that experience. And so, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's been, also interesting having had healthy conversations around sexuality with my parents and then existing in a world where perhaps that's not the norm. Um, and so that's been interesting to, to navigate. I remember in the same story, um, I was in maybe first standard in, in school and we were doing a class on spiders. And I asked my teacher, how do spiders hump? Because this was the last, like, we when our dogs were going at it that's how we talk about it and they got so upset and they never answered my question so I still to this day don't know how that happened and I just feel that's that's so ridiculous like it's such a basic it's such a basic um way to approach it and here you have the child asking you and um and yeah so that's so yeah so I had this healthy relationship at home and then in school it was sort of crushed mm -hmm. so um that's something that's always been tough. and it's actually then leads to another thought which we can't explore today which is the whole difference between urban kids and rural kids and the experience you have of observing nature right mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. uh there's another thing that i wanted to uh, bring in when we were talking about um, Audrey Lord, who I really love uh, reading and I was very happy that um, Nigat brought her in. Uh, it's really interesting actually to read uh, Audrey Lord and to read Adrian Rich kind of tandem. And I remember there was a period of time in which I was reading both their essays, like essays by them at the same time. Audrey Lord is particularly fascinating because she talks about, you know, uh, about being black, but also being lesbian. And then, of course, I think she's, I credit her as being one of those people who first talk about self-care as a radical act, you know, as a revolutionary act. And then Adrian Rich talking about, um, you know, this whole doctrine of compulsory sexuality. I think that's something that I think about. I, I don't have kids, but if I were to have kids also, what does it mean to bring up children to not have to conform to, you know, to, to gender roles and actually to be empowered enough to be able to talk about things? Uh, and I, I, I think uh, I keep coming back to this 
concept of shame. And I sometimes because now I have this real I have the sudden distance from um, India and from my life there and from you know the kind of feedback that you're constantly and often unsolicited. And this constant thing about shame, I feel like it's uh, it, it really has been this rod, you know, that has been um to 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 discipline you, you know, you're constantly being beaten. I think women are constantly being beaten, like all the time. I mean, today I woke up to find out about um a Bahujan activist who was being shot by Kangana run, run out, you know, um, on Twitter, and then of course other like Savarna actresses. It's just a, it just keeps perpetuating itself and I think I mean I keep thinking about how the space of erotic writing could be one that breaks the chain of you know, violent chain of shame you know, how do you constantly and part of the reason why you're not talked about as a sexual being when you're a woman is that shame attached to sex part of the reason your question about how spider's hump was not answered was because it, there's there's shame attached to it, and I think we don't talk enough about about shame as a as a as a way of disciplining. Yes, and I think it's a very complex negotiation between um, educating children about the privacy of their uh, experiences and their sexuality. Uh, and, and shame, uh, and uh, you know, because I think the way that it's been done to say, keep yourself safe is by revealing yourself, you're being shameful. And so that's really a very, very complex negotiation. And I think something that uh, people don't really explore or examine, at least here, you know, in Indian society. And I think that that feeds a lot into the, how we talk about, you know, what is the language? talk about sex what are the things that the public how do you deal with this taboo when so much of taboo is really centered around shape then how do you address or how do you unearth these questions and so much of the reason why so many of us are there are writing with uh, you know with the people of our lives is because we know that they're not able to confront their own feelings so, and I, I, I wanted to bring this up because I wanted to talk about what gives me hope. And sometimes it's this sense of thinking about the future, you know, holding a place for someone, you know, like that empty seat at the table which you're holding for someone who will eventually arrive at the place of consciousness, you know, uh, who's not there yet. And sometimes it takes a lot of patience to just wait around for other people to to get to that state and you have to know that i don't know sometimes i like to think that there is this audience of the future that we are addressing and and they respond and the conversation continues um yeah. it sort of ties in a little bit what sweta was saying about her writing earlier I, actually, the other th I, though I was reminded when uh, of a of a, an elderly grand aunt of ours who was a child widow who used to who lived with an with another a mem a branch of the family and she'd come to visit my grandmother from time to time, and she spoke in the most explicit raunchy way, and she had had I, I presume not much of a sexual experience since she was, you know, a child widow or perhaps she did we don't know. But she was just wild. In fact, sometimes my grandmother would shush her thinking it was inappropriate for her grandchildren to hear this. And so in a sense, I think, um, yes, I think, I mean, even though she was well aware of shame, she lived by the norms of uh, widowhood uh, and she, you know, had such a harsh and terrible, cruel life. She was irrepressible and would tell these stories and these scandals. And so I think you find the language. Sometimes you find the language when you have the need and you, if for her, it was fun. It was joyous to, to tell these scandalous stories and to say things. So I think, you know, I mean, uh, it, it's a very complicated thing. I'm not saying that that's a sort of a simple uh, example of a way in which to find a solution, but I'm just saying that, um, I think the human spirit kind of finds finds a way to express itself, you know. 
Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I know everyone has their own journey towards coming to that point where they're just like, no shame. But I think, I mean, right now what we're going through as a human race, True. we just have to do away with all of that. It's ridiculous that it's still something that limits our, our expression. So, um, I mean, she was an exception. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, I think now uh, the BIC is saying uh, we are coming to the end of the session. So thank you for allowing us to uh, explore these questions that came up uh, through the Zoom audience. And uh, thank you, Rosalind, for bringing it up so that we didn't lose this extended discussion. Um, Gosh, thank you everyone for coming on this panel. It was so generous of you to talk about your work and to uh, talk about uh, this complex and complicated uh, kind of um, examination of writing, which should not be complex and complicated because it's so essential to the human experience. Um, Zoe, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough, Indy. <laughs> and just one more time, Out of Print is 10 years old this yes, year. And, so, old. and the anthology is coming out and it's just a, such a remarkable thing, I think. So uh, thank you for that. saying that. I am, I am delighted and proud of all the writers. And um, yeah, thank you for bringing this and making this happen. And um, yeah, continued conversations, I hope that we can extend on the... Um, the YouTube if uh, other questions come up. So do stay tuned in to the YouTube. Mm -hmm. We'll send you the link. And um, really, thank you for your generosity. I'm sending you all a virtual hug, yeah. <laughs> which, uh, yeah. And um, yeah, we miss you, Rosalind. So you've got to come back and visit when COVID permits mm -hmm. you to travel. Vidya, <laughs> sweet Nigat, thank you for being thank on you, this. Thank you, It was really yeah. nice. Very thank nice you so time. much for yeah, having me. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you, Nikhat, Shweta, mm. Rosalind, Indira, and Zui uh, for this fascinating and um, complex and important conversation that I, and I'm sure everyone who's in this um, um, very lucky group uh, feel fortunate to uh, partake in, to participate in, and we just hope that uh, a lot more people uh, have the same opportunity as we do. Um, I have to apologize for the initial technical uh, uh, glitches with the sound. Uh, it's been eight months since we've, back to, we've, uh, we've come back to this place and there were a few technical cobwebs to blow away, but uh, I think we're set now. Uh, just to remind you, this was a part, the first part of a series of conversations that examine ways to write about fundamental human experiences, partnering with out of print which as we said is turning 10. And thank you everyone. Uh, we will see you next time and good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night.